Are you ready? Are you ready? Yep, we're ready. Um, we're ready. It is an absolutely gorgeous day here in the middle of October in Allegheny County. Blue sky, temperature in the mid 40s, low 50s. I was out working in the wood pile. Light breeze, no bugs. Just great. Great, great weather. It is perfect. Exactly. Okay. Um, last time we ba I babbled on about whatever that topic was <laughs> a week or two ago, two weeks ago, right? Whenever it was. And we didn't get to finish part of it. So before we get to our main topic, which is compost and the heap, we are going to very briefly mention harvesting because you should have some things still growing in your garden. Now, I know I'm a bit lucky. At 2,240 feet on the mostly the top of a hill with a nice woods and a Norway spruce windbreak on the north side, um, I'm somewhat protected from frost. Remember, cold air sinks down to the valley. Now, you're lower down than I am. You've had frost to kill your garden, right? Yes. Like, yeah. The zucchini. The zucchini. The zucchini bought it, yeah. What a mess, right? <laughs> yeah. That's why I always try and pull the zucchini and green beans, tomatoes, peppers before that 32 degree mark, because they do get mushy yeah. to, to pull up after the next day, sad. the day yeah. after. So, um, but what have you still, the, there has not been, and for me, there wasn't even a killing frost, not even 32. It got close one or mm -hmm. two times, 31, 33, and out in the swale, 20 feet lower, it did frost. So what do you still have growing in your garden? We just have kale. Kale. Yeah. And it's happy. Oh, yes. It's, it looks good. And we go out there and pick it for mm -hmm. salads. I think your kale will probably hang in there until it gets down to about 25. You know what else we have actually is some mm -hmm. lettuce, a very small amount of lettuce. Yes. I, I just planted maybe a month ago. Two months ago. That is pretty little. Mm -hmm. yes. they're, okay. They're little My suggestion for needs. next year is in the spring, yeah, in the spring, lettuce, if you want it to grow to maturity, is usually around 60 days, two months. So if you put it in in the middle of April, by the middle of June, you've got a nice head. Okay. That doesn't mean that at the beginning of June or the end of May, when it's a youngster, you can thin out every other one. There'll be little, but, um, and that gives the others more space. However, in the fall, the days are getting shorter, not longer, and it's cooler. So things don't grow as fast. So I would say late July, early August, say early August. Okay. Then you'll have good sized lettuce in September. <laughs> and if you're willing to pay attention to the weather report <laughs> and have those towels and sheets or boxes handy, especially if you've planted it in a consolidated space. Uh -huh. um, I actually have a plastic, I call it a hoop. It's flat and it's rippled and it's, you can bend it like a Quonset hut and they are four feet long and two feet wide. So I can make it into an arch with a few metal uh, stakes, two on each side, and then cover, drape a, uh, a blanket over it at night mm -hmm. to cover up the ends. And in the daytime, it still is a bit warmer, even though the ends are open, although you could close them with something. Um, and if you plant a four foot row, maybe two, possibly three rows, six inches apart, kind of crowded, it would fit under that hoop. And you could extend your lettuce probably until early November, mm. the way we are going lately these years with our... yeah. Um, autumns that linger on and on. All righty. So I'm assuming most everybody's got their tomatoes. What else? Squash, pumpkins, beans, zucchini, <laughs> peppers, all the, and potatoes, by the way. The interesting thing about potatoes is 32 will kill the tops, but you can leave the tubers mm -hmm. in the ground for another two weeks. All right. They might even swell a bit bigger okay even though they don't have any leaves anymore i think i read that somewhere once now my beets my daughter's beets my carrots my green onions radishes lettuce and spinach are still growing because once again i didn't have a freeze freeze yet 
But even if it drops to 28, those things mm. will survive. Um, when it gets below that, if you want your carrots to get bigger or your beets to get, you know, once again, you planted them a little too late in the middle of the summer, um, or you want to extend your lettuce to Thanksgiving time, wouldn't it be nice to have a fresh salad for Thanksgiving? Yeah. You can brag, bragging rights. Then um, you're going to have to start covering them up when they get down to 30 or so, because otherwise the lettuce in particular okay. will probably get zapped at 30 or 28. And you bring, but not mulching, right? Uh, we're not talking about mulching at this okay. point. That's what we're just talking about. Um, just covering. Covering. Yeah. Most of you folks, if you most, sorry, properly <laughs> in June and maybe add it a little late later in August because it does thin out, uh -huh. magically disappears. Um, you don't need to be mulching right now. Okay. That's yeah. going to be our topic. Okay. Next week for the winter. Okay. Um, 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 um. Now we have a few very, very, very hardy crops that even taste better after they're frozen. The idea being it has something to do with chemistry. When you freeze Brussels sprouts, parsnips, and evidently rutabagas, which I didn't realize until just recently, it, some of the starch changes to sugar, which is why you don't store your potatoes in the fridge because you want a starchy potato. You do not want a sweet potato, meaning not the yellow sweet potatoes, but a sweet mm -hmm. regular potato. Um, if you stick your potatoes in the fridge to store, once again, some of the starch is gonna change to sugar and they're gonna taste fun. You could try that as an experiment if you don't believe me. Yes, I have some potatoes in the refrigerator right now. I'm thinking, oops, take them out, take them out. Take them out. Okay, yeah, take them out. Um, so these things, in the old days, people, most people don't eat much in the way of parsnips anymore mm -hmm. or rutabagas, but they were a basic crop years ago because they were hardy and they stored well and you could store them in the ground. They could freeze. Most people, as a matter of fact, left their parsnips in till March or April when the ground thawed, dug them up then, and they were much sweeter hmm. than they would have been fresh in the fall. Okay. We got to move on or we're never going to get done with our compost heap. <laughs> wow. All righty. What did I do here? Oh, yes. Little history, guys. Sorry, I got to do a little history. Um, we're going to be talking about compost. The heap or the pile, however you want to uh, word it and what it is. Well, basically, you put into your compost heap organic matter. So quiz time. Rima, what's organic matter mean? What's organic? I just think of anything that um, came, came from the garden or could have come from the garden. Okay. By the way, putting back it. Poor Rima never gets a, a heads up on my questions. So it's like all of a sudden out of the air. I drop these questions on her. Horse manure is organic. Horse manure is organic. Anything that once was living oh, okay. contains carbon. All of us on the earth that are alive, whether you're plants or animals, we're based on carbon. Okay, we're not minerals. We're not diamonds. We're not gold. We're not mineral dirt. Okay, we once were alive. So, and when we die, <laughs> eventually, quicker or sooner, depending on the situation, we decompose into what is called humus. And it is the humus in the dirt that creates what we call soil. Because if you just have bedrock breaking apart over hundreds and thousands of years to provide dirt, it's mineral soil, and it won't grow much of anything. You need to have organic matter huh. over time. The dead mouse, the dead leaves, the dead grass roots, whatever, dead bodies. Um, adding to the humus in the dirt to make it into soil because it's the humus that does a couple of things. It, it acts like a sponge. So if there's excess rain, it soaks it up. When it's drier, it releases the water back into your soil. It cr helps create that wonderful, we call it an aggregate, meaning that nice, beautiful, crumbly soil 
you know, we're not in the business of making adobe bricks, right? <laughs> if you have too much clay in your soil and you don't have enough humus in it, you work it when it's wet, you wind up with adobe bricks. Mm -hmm. Okay, we all know that in Allegheny County. Um, <laughs> all righty, um, where's my, where, where am I going here with this? Um, it also provides the nutrients. In the humus lives all those microscopic things that we don't know about, plants and animals and fungi and whatever, um, that take some of the elements from the dirt and from the air, like nitrogen, and convert it into a form that the plants can eat. Okay? All right. Now, a few case studies of errors made because of ignorance or greed. Let's go back to Iceland a thousand years ago when the Vikings from Norway came over and discovered Iceland and then Greenland. All righty. Um, and maybe I should talk more about, well, both of them. And they settled around the edges of Iceland and around the southwest coast of Greenland. And what was sitting on the top of Greenland then and now? Ice. The great ice cap you know, a, a mile or two thick, whatever it was. It's not as thick anymore, but back in the day it was. Um, but the fringe, um, there was a bit of a forest growing, not much. Um, the trees might be 10, 15 feet high and as thick as your wrist. But if you cut them down and counted the rings, they might be a hundred years old. But the Vikings, like most people, brought with them their culture which meant cattle. They ate beef. They weren't fish eaters. They brought with them their Christian religion, which meant building a big church, providing it with golden candlesticks, et cetera, et cetera. They still wore their fancy clothes that they wore in Norway. In other words, they did not adapt to the new environment. Now the Inuit had also moved into this area about the same time, a thousand years ago. They came from the West, it took about a thousand years to travel across the Arctic. They had a different culture. They hunted and ate the sea mammals and fish. Yes, our other librarian is checking. What's happening? Yes. People can you, can't get in? Yeah, can you let her? <laughs> Sorry about no. that. Hi, who's there? We don't know. Is somebody there? Oh, well, she's on the phone right now. Oh, she's on the phone. Okay, sorry about that. He, she. All righty, we need a bell. We need to have a yeah. something go ding, ding. Yeah. All righty. So what happened was they cut the trees down for tools and for firewood. And guess what? They assumed that in Norway, had the Norway spruce, big trees grew, grew, grew. Well, they didn't grow back. The soil was so thin and so poor, it could not, you know, it took a hundred years to get, get there. It just did not grow back. And then the other sad thing was, at that time frame, there was a slight warm spell in that part of the world. So through the, from 1,000 to 12,000 or so, 13, times were okay. And then it got cold again, not much doesn't take much and they all died out the norse disappeared from greenland around the late 13 early 1400s and it's still a mystery they're still studying as to why what happened the other is more recent and it's the amazon uh rainforest down in mainly brazil and we're going to talk about the 1900s the last century and into our century now, anybody that has studied this, um, for thousands of years, native indigenous people lived in the Amazon rainforest. But of course, they were in small tribes, maybe 50 people, family related, um, scattered out over this huge area. And they were farmers as well as hunters. And what they would do is, do you know, Rima, have you ever studied this? No. No, good, all right, just say no. <laughs> I think in the fifth grade, we read a, a little book about five cultures, and one was the tribes in the Amazon jungle. Um, they would clear a section in the rainforest, maybe five, 10 acres, have their village and plant their food. 
The soil was good enough for five or six years and then began to peter out. So what did they do? Moved down the jungle a couple of miles, did it again. Now, that was sustainable in those days because there weren't that many people. And they could keep moving around a huge area. And 100 years later, maybe their great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren would come back to the original place, which in 100 years had all grown back up, refurbished the soil, and they could do it all over again. The trouble nowadays is, now, I don't know, Google it. If there were a million back then, there's now 100 million, maybe more in the rainforest. Brazil, the cities, mm -hmm. and they are cutting down much larger swaths of the rainforest, usually for local small backyard farms, homesteading, or for larger corporations that then plant grasses, bring in the cattle, and we eat the McDonald's hamburger. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, after three or four or five or six years, the productivity drops. Mm -hmm. Now you would think, my God, the rainforest, 200 high trees, lush. But the soil is totally poor. All the biodiversity is in the trees, not in the soil. And so when that little bit is used up in the first couple of years, the productivity really plummets. So those are two lessons that we need to learn about what is dirt and what is soil. And how are we going to survive without food? And unless you want to eat chemicals, like when I was a kid, we drank Tang, <laughs> the orange juice of the astronauts. <laughs> um, and of course, we could go that direction, but I don't know. Mm. Okay, those were case studies out there in the in in the history and that sort of thing. But I have two personal stories about the soil before we take a look at, I had Rima look up some a soil profile so we can see what actually is under our feet. Um, I've told this before from time, time and again, but I don't know if you all have heard it. I lived for four or five years in Kentucky, about the middle part of the state, a little more towards the west, and just three miles south of the Ohio River. We were on a ridge and our backyard dropped down and every year in the spring, at least once, sometimes twice, the Ohio River would flood and the floodwaters would reach our backyard. So um, I had a garden or, or it was the furry for, we moved in the fall and the next spring there had been a garden there by the old orchard in our backyard. And I decided I'd have my garden again, like always. Well, our dog got hit by a semi-trailer on the two lane and was dead. And my husband, who never did things by half, went to the edge of the garden and dug her grave three feet down. All topsoil. Wow. Rich, black, crumbly, no rocks, topsoil. It wasn't no wonder that the beans I grew there, compared to the beans I grew here, mm -hmm. grew twice as same, same bean seeds, twice as high, twice as wide, four times more productive. Mm -hmm. Number two, and I, I should have brought the pictures, darn it. I was thinking earlier this morning, then got sidetracked with my wood pile. Um, we're going to talk about my compost heap in a little while, but and on the second year of, the, of its history, my, my compost heap takes a year and a half. So in the second spring, I plant on top of it uh, several things, one of which is my butternut squash, which traditionally you've gotten some of the excess every year. The vines... It's like Jack's beanstalk, horizontal. <laughs> Come the middle of July, I start with my scissors, keeping it contained. But that one little seed, one vine that branches, will give me usually 18 four-pound beautiful butternut squash. Now, I don't know. I don't remember why I did this. About five years ago, maybe it was to do an experiment. I don't remember why. I went over to the edge of the garden, a little bit less sun, so maybe that had something to do with it. Regular old ground, no soil that had been added to over the years, improved, just whatever was there, and planted another one. It was just amazing. That particular seed only grew about, at the most, six feet in diameter and produced four to five butternut squash. 
it's all in the soil. Mm -hmm. The deeper and the better your soil, the more productive you can be. Now, I could grow my 18 butternut squash if I wanted to, you know, use a lot more space. Mm -hmm. Who wants to do that? All righty. What else? Um, <clears throat> now, our soil in Allegheny County is generally a young soil. What happened here 20,000 years ago, Rima? Do you remember the glacier? Oh, okay. Where the Finger Lakes came from. Right. Uh, among Great. other things. Yeah. yeah. Among other things. Okay. Starting about 20, 25,000 years ago, we had another drop in global temperature. And the glacier that originated up in Canada began creeping south, finally got to us, kept going down about halfway through Pennsylvania before it stopped. And when it went back oh, and it ground everything, it was a big bulldozer. So there went all our topsoil, all our plants, whatever, couldn't move, got moved by the glacier. And when it retreated then, it dropped behind what we call till <laughs> or Allegheny soil, which number one is not very deep, anywhere from four inches to a foot, mm -hmm. filled with a lot of rocks of all sizes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And every now and again, a boulder that we call an erratic. Okay, and by the way, if you're a geologist, you can analyze those rocks and find out where in Canada they came from, which is kind of neat, yeah. I think. Yep. I didn't realize that happened so recently. Only 20,000 years? That was a, the beginning. 25,000 years ago was the beginning of the last, <laughs> and maybe really the last with global warming, we may never have another one, onset of the glacier is moving south. But they started retreating about... 12,000, 10,000 years ago. Yeah. So by at least 8,000 years ago, it was gone from New York State, moving new, moving back north, leaving behind this crappy soil that we have, right? Yes. The other thing it did, that glacier was at least a mile and a half high, 5,700, no, 7,500 feet. Imagine how much that weighed. So it compressed all the oh, subsoil yeah. that got left behind. The bedrock got tipped. Um, and it's rebounding, by the way. All righty. So we have thin, uh, rocky, <laughs> young soil that's not that nutritious. And it has a lot of clay, at least around here, yes. in the uh, subsoil. Yep. So at this point, now I thought I have to be funny here. She secretly works when she's not at the library for the FBI, and she's their profiler. So I asked her to do a profile of our soil so we can see what it looks like. Oh, that's terrible. So can you find it? And who's out there? Anybody? Can we hear you? I am. Sassy <laughs> Percy. Ooh, what is that? You no, I, hear, little... I hear a little voice. You hear? We hear, we hear a squeak that sounded like a mouse. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Sassy. it's us. Maybe we have to turn you up. Well, what I'm thinking, I want to make this bigger. Squint, squint. And I've done it before. Cecily? Sassy. We see you. Sassy. But we really can't hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Well, that's good. Let's see. How can I make it bigger? And Rima is trying to make this teeny tiny image <laughs> bigger. Well, I'm looking at it. Okay. I can't remember how I did it. Yeah. <laughs> so annoying. Well, anyway, I'll start babbling yeah, away about this start. teeny tiny picture. Um, <laughs> profiles of the soil, which starts at the top and goes down to the bedrock, varies around the world depending on what kind of climate and geology you have. So I asked Rima to find the one here in Western New York that until what, the early 1800s, and the white folks started moving through, cutting down the forest to create farmlands and pasture, um, we have a typical type of profile for what had been um, underneath a forest, a deciduous forest. And there's only maybe one, two inches of humus on the top. And then we have, um, your topsoil, which depending on how long 
nature has been working to create it. And some say, normally, on average, it takes 100 years to make an inch of topsoil. Mm -hmm. So when you don't garden properly or graze too many cattle or sheep on your pastures, um, one good windstorm or tornado or flood can wash away 100 years of nature's work in creating your topsoil. An inch is easily blown or washed away. Underneath the topsoil is what we all hit with our spading forks, uh, anywhere from six inches down to maybe a foot down here in Allegheny County, and that's our subsoil. And for us, that has a lot of clay in it, so it's hard to dig in. Often mm -hmm. it's mixed with rocks. Yes. And eventually, if you go down far enough, although about a half a mile up my road, where the main road goes over the hilltop, mm -hmm. um, we have bedrock within a foot of the top of the ground. So um, that's a soil profile. And what we're interested in is the top two parts, the topsoil and the organic litter that's lying on the top of that, that can get mixed in. Maybe this. Uh -huh. I do it on the air, by the way. Everybody can. Yes. Thanks. Oh, here we go. Can you read with I want my glasses? Is that Sassy? What's her first name? Sassy. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, now yeah. can you see it better? Oh, yes. much better. Yes. Much better. <laughs> All righty. Now, be, so that's what regular old soil without our trying to do anything about it would look like. Um, and the luckier you are, the deeper is zone A, you know? So, but, so what we want to do is increase zone A by a variety of means. And one of them is by adding compost. Now, a little bit of history on compost. I think, and you can double check, because sometimes I read this stuff years and years and years ago. And since I don't have a computer, I can't necessarily find out when and where and who and how. It's my memory, which sometimes is good and sometimes isn't. So in general terms, it was some English colonist, let's say a retired major living in India, <laughs> um, and was aware of the problem with farming there. I'm sure he didn't go out and farm. <laughs> he probably had a lot of Indians working for him. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, and he realized one of the problems was because of the climate, it was so hot that any litter, whether it was grasses or leaves or manure, very rapidly disintegrated and vanished and left the soil poorer. And of course, think of mother nature, my woods, whatever is there, all those leaves, all those dead red squirrels or whatever, die and they stay put. They decompose on top of the ground and gradually get incorporated into the leaf litter and then into the soil, that's the top few inches. But as soon as you start farming, especially modern day farming, the big farms, talking about square miles, almost everything is taken off the land. Um, for instance, corn, the corn goes, but why just waste the corn stalks? They can be chopped up and sold for fuel. Okay, so every, the farmer who's trying to make money is trying to use everything they can without thinking about repaying the soil, what it has lost in making that crop. So this fellow somewhere in the middle, I think of the 1800s in India, decided if that they could add back to the farmland some of this um, organic matter like manure, leaves, etc. Uh, it would keep the soil fertile and therefore productive. So that's where that got started. And when I started gardening, oh God, decades and decades ago, Mr. Rodale was the famous man on the scene. And can I remember his little magazine? Can you remember what it was? It wasn't. No, it was I know about Rodale's. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Organic Garden Magazine came out of that. But before that, in the wonderful. 40s, he had this little magazine that came out every month. And I'm for Horace, forgetting the title. I've read every. Yeah, title. me too. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing them. Yep. Yeah. I'm reading them. 
Well, his whole policy was twofold, but we're only going to talk about the one. The other is for another whole topic. One, incorporating more organic matter one way or the other into your soil to enrich it. And the other was not to use pesticides and herbicides. That's another topic for another day. Um, so that's kind of the history of it. Now let's get back to what it is and how are we doing on time? Everything always takes longer than I think. Weird. We have half an hour. Oh, a half hour. Yeah. Good. All right. I'm going to call it a compost heap. Now, there are several ways of doing this. <laughs> and even though once upon a time I was a chemist, I do not practice the correct way of making the correct compost heap. Uh oh. <laughs> However, there are some basics in general that everybody needs to follow, whether they want to be fastidious or more casual. And think of Mother Nature, nature as the casual end. <laughs> and think of my sister, the yuppie gardener in Connecticut with the barrel, the compost barrel, as the fastidious, is that the word? Fastidious. Yeah. Fastidious one. All righty. A compost heap has to be really at least four feet by four feet by four feet. And the reason for this is chemistry or physics. If you want something to decompose, chemically react, mm. you need heat and moisture. And if it's all spread out, the heat that's being generated can't be focused and won't do much good. But a four by four by four pile will generate enough heat after two, three, four weeks that if you stick your hand in, you'll get burnt. Okay. Um, the other thing I could have done, Rima, and didn't, was make a three-layer chocolate cake with green frosting. <laughs> you should have done that, Mary Lee. You should have done that. Oh, yeah. maybe I'll do it next. Well, our next week is our last week. Maybe I'll do it then. Okay. Okay. Just letting you know. You, you want done that. Uh, peppermint in the frosting? Sure. Yes. Remind me. Call me up on Thursday. <laughs> Get the okay. compost cake. A compost cake. The reason being, sometimes something like that is so visual that it just solves a lot of what should I do? How much is how much? Because if you're doing it properly, you want a certain ratio of what we call brown stuff, think carbon, and green stuff, think nitrogen. So the chocolate cake gives you the rough proportions. There's going to be much more brown stuff than green stuff in your compost heap, and it should be layered. Doesn't do any good to put three feet of brown stuff on the bottom and then dump all the green stuff on top. <laughs> that to be mixed. All righty. So now, once again, I don't do this, but many people, if you have corn stalks or sunflower stalks or maybe some twigs, you might want to lay a base about six inches high on the bottom. That will keep your air coming through and chemistry re it requires some dampness, not sogginess, not drenched dampness, some heat and some air, good old oxygen, all right? Um, we want an oxygen kind of decomposition because otherwise it could turn out to be smelly. Mm -hmm. Anaerobic, is it? Anaerobic in the swamps where it decomposes under the water, no oxygen, and then it kind of stinks. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Um, so six inches of brush or whatever to give some air space underneath, and then start piling up your dry brown stuff. I don't know, maybe six, eight inches, and then maybe a couple inches of green stuff. Then, it, then I every foot, if you're doing it this way, every foot, then I'd go over to my garden and grab a shovel full of good soil, which has all those microbes in it, all the little fungi, maybe a few earthworms, and toss it over the four feet by four feet. Mm -hmm. It's like an inoculant. Mm -hmm. It's like the salt in your food. It gives that oomph. And then if it's all dry for some reason, get the hose out and give it a good sprinkling damp not too wet then once again if you're on this role of being the perfectionist <laughs> after two or three weeks <laughs> you're gonna have to get your hay fork muscle building time and get out there and 
flip the pile. Inside to the outside, outside to the inside. And I came up with another wonderful visual, Rima, the other night thinking about this. Those of you that know anything about the emperor penguins, and I, I'm going to call them a flock. I don't know if they have a special name or not, but maybe 40,000 birds are down there on the ice shelf out over the ocean off of Antarctica. And um, the males are, are all together with the egg on their feet and the female's gone off to feed. And she comes back three months later and they switch. And they're in this huddle making funny noises and kind of shuffling around. And it's, can you believe, 40 below. And that doesn't matter if it's Fahrenheit or centigrade because they cross at that point. And the wind may be blowing 40 miles an hour. So they shuffle around and the ones on the outside wind up then on the inside and the inside ones wind up. On, so it's like the compost heap. You got to keep moving around to even out the heat. Right. And get right. the old parts warm. So, okay. So that's the hard way to do it. Now, did you get, you got some pictures of people's compost heaps, right? Yes. So the simplest would be just make a pile about four by four by four. It can be bigger, but above four feet, it gets kind of hard for us without, you know, if you're not a bodybuilder to toss it up above four feet. So that's why I think four feet high is about a good size. Now, if you want it more neat, you can edge your space with cinder blocks or pallets. Okay, here, here's, our, here's our not neat. Okay, there's just a heap, a pile. It's not quite a cube either. Okay. That's neat. That's a big old pile. You don't have neat? It look, you know what it looks like? I've been doing research on another program called Those Amazing Birds. It looks like the nest of the thermometer bird. <laughs> but other than that, okay, there's a pile. What do we have next? Okay. Let's see. What did we have next? Oh, nope. Don't want that guy. Okay. There we go. Now, a keen eye driver spots these pallets every now and again in certain places sitting on the side of the road and they're free for the taking. I mean, don't go into somebody's yard and take one, but unless you ask, but th there are some places that give them away. And three of those on three sides, because you want one side open so you can aerate the pile, right? What happened? It was big and then it went away. I know, yeah. I tried to make it bigger and then I messed everything up. Okay, well, that person had to have four sides, which means you have to have one side to take down when you're working on it. Did Just you, keep talking, Mary. I, 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 I can see what I did wrong, but what... Um, Rima is really great. If it were me on the computer, forget it. It would be all pictures in your head. I'll show you what the problem is. See that right there, yeah. that little huh? guy? Yeah. That's what I want to press on. But every now and then I hit stop share uh, by accident you. because it's right so close. there. So I'm being really careful that that is beautiful. Now, and that's what you were just talking about, right? Right, but that's not a palette. That is something they built out of yeah. four by ones, looks yeah. like. Yeah. I'll get my husband right on that. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no we, you're going to go my route here when we're done with these others. You have all the cinder blocks? Doesn't matter. No, we don't have cinder, cinder okay, blocks. Okay, but you could use better. cinder blocks. Um, but once again, that's going to be kind of expensive, mm -hmm. I'm sure. And heavy. And heavy to move. Yep. Yeah. Um, where am I here? I have a picture of the cinder block one. Did you want me to? Because actually, that's three sided, if I remember rightly. Right. Yeah. It's a little different. Right. You told us not to use cinder block. Because of the leaching or something. Some, some people do. Some people do. I would not use a cinder block around a acid-loving garden, like blueberries. Or, but for something like this, probably it would be okay. I think this. But why they would want to do that. Okay. Oh, now we're getting to the really fussy people. Here we have a series of contain, um, spaces. And what you do is you start on one end. I'm not sure which end that would be. It all looks the same. It's, yeah, it does, doesn't it? Hmm. Hmm. But let's pretend this was your day one. All the stuff. And you could see everything. You could see the onion tops. You could see the dead lettuce, the eggshells, the whatever. The dead nose. Okay, after, say, two to four weeks, depending on your temperature and the rain and things like that, um, how small everything was. The smaller the particles, if you want to run them through a shredder, you'll get finished compost much faster. Hi, Regina. Um, then you have to move it over 
to space two. <laughs> Put your new stuff in space one. And you keep working down. By the time you get to space four in three to four months, it's ready to put in the garden. Hmm. Hmm. A lot of work. Yeah. A lot of work. So All right. Can I ask a question? Sure. I have a question. Uh, Sethi, how do you say your name, Sethi? She's disappeared. Um, there's somebody online. This is Regina. I bought a composter at the Tinker Town Hardware. Like a barrel? Yeah. Yeah. And it's pretty full. So what do I do with it? Have you already addressed that? No. Wait, there. Okay. That's a good question. I can wait. Okay. Do we have a picture of one of those barrels? No. No. Okay. If you speak up, everybody can hear. It's describe the barrel and what you've done, how, how you use it. I've been using a composter that's up on a, a, a metal rack all summer. I've been adding <clears throat> tea bags and leaves and different things, weeds into it. And it's pretty full now. Have you been, does it have a turn on it? Turns. So okay. I, Keep it turning clockwise. Mm -hmm. You know, I lost it, Regina. Something in it. I about every day or two, I okay. turn it, mm -hmm. and it's not decomposed, but it's pretty full. So, what do I do with it? I would dump it outside and make an old fashioned compost heap. Like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I tend to be, and this is just me, Regina, a minimalist. And the older I get, the less work I want to spend on getting my results. Mm -hmm. And if it's possible to do less work and get the same results, why not? Also less expensive. So I'm not going to suggest anybody buy one of those things. Um, I'm thinking if you live like my sister does in a very upscale, mm -hmm. suburban, close space in Connecticut, where neighbors might frown upon, what is that? in your backyard then buying one of those barrels it's out of sight it's out of mind or it's inside but it doesn't look yes like it, it looks like um a barbecue set from the distance or something that's right yeah okay so all right um before we get to my version the lazy person's <laughs> compost heap i want to mention what are you guys can chip in what would be the brown stuff that has the carbon in it that we add to our compost heap you mentioned one thing from the mm -hmm. horses. Oh, the manure. Manure. Yeah. What else? Yeah, I can smell it coming up here today at the from the bottom. Yes. Yeah. About that. Yes. <laughs> get some. The manure. Horse manure from up there. Oh, you said something else. Oh, leaves. The leaves at this time of year, especially. Yeah. Somebody told me leaves have a lot of nutrition in them. A lot of. Well, think of the forest. Who goes out there into my 10 acres? Do I fertilize it every year? No. Mother Nature does. Recycles. Okay. Grass clippings. No, no, no. They're they're green stuff. Okay. Um, right. What about paper? What else did I have here? Um, do you have something? Yeah. What about paper? Would that be brown paper? Oh, good question. Um, there's still some controversy about the ink in colored paper, but black and white stuff is okay nowadays. I think 40 years ago it wasn't, but they've changed the ink or whatever. So if you have newspapers, black and white, that's fine. Um, here's another story from the home lines. Years ago when my kids were little, we had a pair of gerbils, those little rodents from Mongolia, I think originally the gerbils came from. And they were in a cage and every day I would give them the junk mail. And they would, well, and they would shred it up, make yeah. this nice little house that they would sleep in. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, me and old mother, would take away their house and give them the new junk mail. And then I would take up their shredded paper and put it in my compost heap. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> I actually got a free year to Mother Earth News for that story years ago. <laughs> That's back. a good story though. Yeah. You to use, you know. Why not? As a matter of fact, the tech, I understand, now takes all their shredded documents which is everything nowadays. They want all the teachers to shred everything. And they take it up to the horse barn for litter. Now, maybe they mix it in with some other you straw. For bedding? Bedding, bedding, oh. yeah. Oh, litter. Litter, no, bedding. Yeah. Yeah. Sim that's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Oh, that's what, okay. So that's, and sawdust within reason. You don't want tons of sawdust, partly because that takes a long time to break down. Okay. And in the breaking down, 
it uses up nitrogen to do that. Uh -huh. So you're depleting part of your the benefit from your compost if it's too much sawdust. What's the green stuff, guys? <laughs> grass. Grass. <laughs> what else? Um, um, Scraps oh. from you know your house like lettuce and things like that there's always something left over that you forgot in the back of the fridge or if you have a teenager they will not eat though whatever um eggshells coffee grinds now what don't you put in unless you want the bears and the um raccoons and the skunks rats we don't have rats out in the country thank god any kind of meat meat <clears throat> Bones, bones, fat, sugar, but butter, rather butter, oil. Those kinds of things attract things you don't want <laughs> your compost heap. And I must admit, after thirty years of having one on the hill out in the country, and there are all those animals around. Black bear every four years, I see one. Um, skunks regular, you know, not too many, but are there. You smell them once in a while. The raccoons definitely. They've never come and messed in my compost heap. I think that's really incredible. You know, we, I never see anything in our, oh no, I take that back. The deer, the deer go in. Ah, well, the, okay. The heat. But that's okay. Just I don't, you, well, the deer are eating everything. So then let them eat up some of your compost. Yeah, if you have pumpkin rinds in there or grapefruit, they love, they love grapefruit. Grapefruit, they really? Clear it right out. I think it's the deer doing that. I had in, I had things, I was making one just on top of the ground out mm -hmm. back the park. And things disappeared. So some animals like raccoons or something was mm -hmm. taking it out. Yeah. Yep. So I, it's amazing. You don't have that because you're out in a more dusty yeah, area. I know. <laughs> and I used to spend a lot more time out in the garden. So maybe that's part of it. I don't know. Every now and again, you just get lucky. Now, one thing I'm going to suggest, um, I six months out of the year the eggshells go in as well but now that i've started running the wood stove i dry out my eggshells and when they're dry just beginning to get brown i can crunch them up real small in my the palm of my hand and put them in a jar so by the end of the winter i'll have i don't know maybe a quart of mushed up eggshells a lot of calcium and magnesium in those shells mm -hmm. Tomatoes and peppers appreciate the extra magnesium and calcium. So, and I only grow two tomato plants and my daughter grows like four pepper plants. So there was enough eggshell to, um, now I don't sprinkle it on the top of the ground because I'm thinking hmm, that might attract a skunk or something. So I loosen up the soil, maybe scrape it away a bit and sprinkle it four or five inches down mm -hmm. underneath where those plants are going to grow. And then cover it up and plant the plant anyway so where am i eggshells do, 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 do. all righty now and we'll get to what we do with this compost at the end of what i my compost tea which i really like that one no, right, you're going to have to think of, uh, this is in your mind's eye, everybody, already. Okay. All right. Uh, mind's <laughs> eye. Um, my compost heap is to the west edge of the garden, beyond the picket fence, right adjacent. And it's 20, the area is 20 feet long and six feet wide. I use half of it. Let's start year one. Okay, it's year one. So 10 feet by six feet. That's where I'm going to pile everything, and I don't layer it. I don't think about proportions. Whatever is available, whenever it's available, gets dumped there. And you said even weeds. Yeah. Now, okay, that's a good question. <laughs> if you have a proper compost heap, which I don't, that four by four by four that gets hot, 150, the weed seeds will get, almost all of them will get killed. Right. Along with pathogens, your earthworms are going to move out of there for a while. <laughs> they don't want it that hot, but they'll come back when it cools down mm -hmm. after the initial heat surge. I never get it that hot. So, yeah, I'm probably putting weed seeds back in the garden. But since I mulch, I don't have to worry too much about that. Mm -hmm. um, so the whole summer goes by and gradually I wind up with a pile that's about 10 feet long, six feet wide, and at least two, maybe three feet high. 
depending on the year. And everything just goes in there. Year two in the spring, I, ha I have this whole empty section, but that's gonna become the compost heap for that year, the second mm -hmm. year. Going back to where the first old now, year old compost heap is, um, I, I make two depressions in the leaves about 18 inches in diameter, you know, one down towards the south end and one more towards the middle. And then I get um, a half a bucket for each depression of my good topsoil. And I spread it out. And in that depression filled with a few inches of topsoil, two of them, in the one I plant, I transplant my pie pumpkin, which is winter luxury, and my butternut squash. Mm -hmm. And they're about a month old and about, they have about four to six leaves. And I do this usually the third week in May. And I have a box or two sitting by them because you know, the third week in May, we're gonna have, probably have maybe a little touch of frost mm -hmm. or cold weather. And so I'll go, and they don't like that. So I'll cover them up most nights for maybe three weeks into, into June when things settle down and start getting warmer. Now that the remnants of that original compost heap, which are now a year old, still have some residual heat in them. Not much, but enough to keep those warm season mm. crops happier and get them growing sooner. That's All right. a good idea. Okay, the summer goes by. <clears throat> this pile number two has done what the one the year before has done, built up. At the end of the season, before a frost, middle of September, late September, early October. <clears throat> uh, oh, back up. The soil is so deep and rich <clears throat> that these vine plants go crazy. So usually by the middle of July, they are, as I said to Rima earlier before we started, it's like Jack Beanstalk going sideways and they're invading the garden and they're into the lawn. So I get my scissors and I just start trimming them back. Because once definitely early August comes around, any flowers that are made at that point aren't gonna be able to have enough time and the weather starts getting cooler yeah. to mature anyway. So you want the energy from the plant to go into maturing those that you already have. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Then at the end of the year, before it frosts, because you don't want it to frost, you clip leaving a good two inches of the stem. You don't want to take the stem off because that will allow rot to go in. They won't store well. And you maybe if it's a nice day, let it sit out for the day, but then bring it in to a cool, dry place. And some things will last till March some Christmas time, depending on mm -hmm. the variety. Your pumpkins, pumpkins do? So I only grow pie pumpkins. Well, that's not true. They're little, right? It depends. Okay. Um, there, I grow, originally I grew an heirloom called, yes, <laughs> New England pie pumpkin. And that was fairly small, six to eight inches, made one nice pie and has been around for a hundred years or more. But recently, as Rima knows, I, I decided to try something called Winter Luxury, which is also, I believe, an heirloom, but a little bigger. Um, 10 inches? I had one this year that was a foot in diameter. Hmm. Um, doesn't look like the usual orange ribbed. It's gently ribbed, but it has a netting over it, so it's not as orangey orange. But they make the most wonderful, creamy yeah. pumpkin pies I've ever tasted. So anyway, um, this compost heap year two gives me from one tiny little seed, 18, four pound butternut squash. Oh. Wow. And not as many pumpkins, 12 of the pumpkins. Okay. And if you do zucchini, that reminds me of another story. Mm -hmm. I suggest all you gardeners read Mr. Blanding's Bill's his dream house or watch the old movie with Cary Grant and I forget who the wife was um, the book I think was written in the late 30s about a businessman from New York City who decides to move to the country up to Connecticut and buy an old farmhouse no he didn't buy the farmhouse he was going to build his house and it's hysterical I built my house it's an hysterical funny 
and they also had to have a garden. What did they know? So they, in those days, the late 30s, there was only some local farmer in the area that could come up to you, city person, and plow up your acre for your garden, right? So what did they plant? I don't remember. A lot of stuff, but the end row, 50 feet, were zucchini plants. <laughs> Exactly. Zucchini plants. 50 feet of zucchini plants. <laughs> well, if anybody's ever listened to Garrison Keeler, Prairie Home Companion, you know what happens in um, August in Lake Wobegon. You can't leave your car unlocked or your front porch unlocked because you'll wind up in the morning coming and there's somebody left a bushel of zucchini for you. So what happens in the story is somewhere along the line in summer, there's a fire in the back end of the new house that they're building. And the local fire department comes to put it out. And what do they do? They just run the garden down with their tr fire truck to get to the back of the house, right? Mm -hmm. Except that last row of 50 feet of zucchini. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you only need one, maybe two zucchini plants uh -huh. because they are super, super, super productive. Mm -hmm. um, and I suggest you pick them when they're four to six inches. Forget this thing you see in the store. Yeah. They don't taste good. Yeah. Even my chickens in the old days when I had chickens, uh, there would always be one that somehow escapes. You, I don't know how that happens, but you miss one. And all of a sudden, there's this three-foot zucchini. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's another story. A year ago on the BBC radio program, time will, well, we're just going to run over an hour. Um, some farmer in, no, some gardener in England, some guy in his backyard somewhere in England was digging in his garden and thought, oh my God, that is a huge marrow. And that's another word for our zucchinis, I believe. Well, it wasn't a marrow. It was one of those unexploded World War II bombs <laughs> that looked like a zucchini. <laughs> so anyway zucchinis um they can all be planted there and once again if you start the zucchini four weeks ahead of time which means late april put it out third week in may with a box nearby to cover it and get if it gets cold you'll have zucchini by the fourth of july and then you'll have them till rice kills the plant yeah and you'll probably even if you pick them four to six inches long after a bit you'll you'll be getting almost one a day right yeah they're very productive yeah they are all right um okay very quickly we're probably out of time but what do you do with then after you you've pulled up your vines and you have your compost it's a year and a half old now and it's everything has disappeared it's just a little dark and crumbly and it smells nice and i have just enough my 10 by 6 by maybe it's only a foot high by then um i have about eight, nine rows in the garden that are anywhere from 18 inches to 30 inches wide. They're raised up, you know, within the garden. I just um, put about an inch down on top of the rows of the compost. And then since I'm not deep spading anymore, I just take my spading fork and flip over the top four inches. So an inch of that compost with the top three inches of soil and let the earthworms and the rains do the rest. Underneath your compost pile, nurse paper. No, cardboard. just just dirt. Just dirt. Yeah, just the ground. Yeah, just the ground. And I tend to get a whole truckload of leaves in the fall. So what I uh, tend to do is, um, over the new pile that's now you know maybe two three feet high, depending on the year, I just sprinkle a couple in you know three four five six seven eight inches of leftover leaves unmowed, just plain old leaves. Mm -hmm. And if there's some extra, I might dump a few wheelbarrow loads of leaves over where um, the compost has been removed. And the following year will be the new compost pile. So it takes a little longer. You, pro you do lose some nutrients because the grass on the west side of the compost pile is greener and grows more lush than the other grass. Now, one quick idea would be and I tried it, but then I didn't, I have a small garden, didn't want to waste the space in the garden. You could put your compost heap right in the middle of your garden. Oh, yeah. So any leaching of nutrients wouldn't leach into your soil and you wouldn't have to carry it as far. Yeah. That's a good idea. It is. Yeah. yeah. Do I have time for one more quickie? 
Well, we just run over late, right? Well, the you, problem is these people are waiting to use the journal's room. Okay, tell them to come on in and use it and I'll be done. Um, if you're going to do something like asparagus, you could dig your trench in the fall, maybe six inches deep, and put your compost from the winter from your kitchen, the bowl from your kitchen, dump it in the trench. And until you have a really, really, really hard freeze, you can always knock a little soil on top of it. And then by April, when you're going to plant your asparagus, you have a layer of decomposing organic matter, which the asparagus will love. Okay. You're right. Yeah, I'm ready. We have people that want to use the library. Super, yeah. So, all Thank right, you. Nina, good to see you again. Yeah. And Ceci, Thank you, Mary Lou. Still there. Yeah. I came yeah. late because it was so nice out. I didn't want to leave. The clouds are 